Hebrews 7, verse 11 to 28. Now if perfection have been, had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what farther need would there be or would there have been for another priest to arise? After the order of Melchizedek, rather than one name after the order of Aaron. For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe, from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, and in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about the priest. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest, not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witness of him, you are a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and usefulness. For the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath. For those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. But this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, The Lord has sworn, and I and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. This makes Jesus the guarantor of, of a better covenant. For the former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Aaron, thank you very much indeed. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we pray that your word would be our guide. We ask that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher. And we pray that your glory would be our supreme concern. For Jesus' sake, amen. Well, we all know that life and ministry have been incredibly hard for many over the past two years with COVID, lockdowns, and all the associated struggles. There has been exhaustion and weariness the multiplicity of decisions that pastors have been expected to make on a weekly basis has been wearying. We've been encouraged, required to lead our people through new terrain where we're not quite sure where we're going, and there are different viewpoints about where we should be going within the church family. And amidst all that tension, all those struggles, and all that weariness, 
we now emerge, perhaps as churches slightly smaller, more fragile, perhaps weaker, with fewer volunteers, perhaps fewer young people. And the result for many of us, if we're honest, is that sense of running out of energy. Not just because it's late afternoon on a hot day in the middle of London, but because of the whole context of what we've been through over recent years. Pastoral ministry is hard enough anyway. It's hard enough over the long haul of many, many years. And how much harder, given what we've experienced in recent years. And so it's no surprise that some of us might, over recent months and years, felt that we've been drifting, not enough energy to to reshape things as we would want them, perhaps feeling a bit sluggish, not enough energy for new initiatives. And we gather at EMA and Uh, Over the coffee queue or in the book room, we overhear conversations about other churches, other ministries, about exciting plans, about planting, about powerful new initiatives, about wonderful new resources. And yet, inwardly, inwardly, we're struggling, we're weary. What is it that I need And of course, the book of Hebrews was written for believers facing very different sorts of circumstances, a very different situation in the first century AD than ours. But of course, there are familiar themes. That theme of drifting, chapter 2, verse 1, or perhaps chapter 6, verse 11 and 12, uh, We desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end, that encouragement to get going uh, so that you may not be sluggish. And perhaps there's some of us thinking, but that's where I am in my church or in my parish or in my ministry. And the solution that our author offers is wonderfully not new techniques. What he offers is wonderfully not new programs, not new resources, not new initiatives, but the solution that our author offers in this letter, simply put in chapter 3 verse 1, is consider Christ. Or in chapter 12 verse 2, look to Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus. And that's going to be the focus of these three conference sermons at the end of each of the days of EMA. Just for us to spend time considering Christ. Of course we know Jesus, but have we seen Jesus from this angle? And that's going to be the exciting adventure that we'll be on. We're actually only going to focus on six verses this afternoon. Chapter 7, verses 20 to 25. But our first heading, we're going to try to put things in context. We're just going to call it Jesus, our high priest. And we're just going to very briefly track what happens from chapter 4, verse 14, all the way to chapter 10 and verse 25. Jesus, our high priest. Uh, With Google Maps, it's great to know where you are. But I I love the Ordnance Survey Maps because it enables you to understand that wider context, what's around, making sense of the landscape, getting our bearings. And that's what we will need to do before we focus on our six key verses. So there is this very long central section Chapter 4, verse 14. The introduction is verses 14 to 16, where we're encouraged to view Jesus as our high priest, and through him we receive grace and mercy. But it begs a lot of questions. How come this 
uh, that Jesus fits into this category of priest, since he was not from the line of uh, Levi, the line of Aaron. So how, how does that work? And, and how do we receive that mercy and grace? And so there are then, after that introductory few verses, there are two major sections. The first is chapters 5, 6, and 7, which focuses on Jesus as our high priest. And that there is a, a sort of bookend, chapter 5, verses 1 to 3, and then at the end, chapter 7, verses 26 to 28, that, as it were, gather all the pieces together. Very quickly, as we uh, try to make sense of that, chapter 7, verse 26, the contrast with sinful priests, we have Jesus as a holy, unstained priest. Chapter 7 and verse 28, another contrast between priests appointed by the law and the son appointed by an oath. We'll need to come back to that. And in the middle, chapter 7, verse 27, he has no need, like those high priests, uh, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins, then for those of the other people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. And that thought is the hook that is going to lead to the second main section in the middle here, from chapter 8, verse 1, all the way to chapter 10, verse 18, where we focus not on Jesus as the high priest, but Jesus as that priestly sacrifice. And then we come to the conclusion, chapter 10, or the climax, chapter 10, verses 19 to 25. Therefore, brothers, sisters, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, that's chapter 8 to 10, 18, by the new and living way that he opened up for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh. And since we have a great priest, that picks up chapters 5, 6, and 7, then he launches into his encouragements. Let us, let us, let us. But this is the, as it were, the doctrinal engine room for his teaching. And Jesus as the high priest is very, very significant. But I wonder how significant it is in our own thinking. Jesus as prophet, whose word comes to us, yes. Jesus as the king, the ruler, the Lord of all, yes. Jesus as that priestly sacrifice, uh, dying on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, yes. But Jesus as our priest, it's not quite such familiar territory for us. And therefore, as we dive in, we recognize that there is perhaps new material for us to be chewing over. And as we dive in to these chapters 5, 6, and 7, we will also note that there is one key Old Testament text, which is, if you like, the fuel in the engine room. It propels the teaching. It is Psalm 110, verse 4. It occurs in those quote forms in three occasions, chapter 5, verse 6 chapter 7, verse 17, and chapter 7, and verse 21. And it may be that for some of us, it feels a little bit like a footnote. It's good to have footnotes, but often they are a distraction to the main argument. Indeed, some publishers now, rather than footnotes, they put them out at the end as endnotes to avoid any distractions whatsoever. And it's possible to treat these Old Testament quotes like that. Well, it's helpful support. It's corroborating what the author to the Hebrews is wanting to say. But actually, that would be to get things the wrong way round. 
It's actually the fuel in the engine room which drives the agenda. It's not that we have a key New Testament passage and the Old Testament supports it, but if you like, it's the other way round. Here we have a massive Old Testament text, and it's the New Testament which is helping to unpack it so that we understand it better. And perhaps just an aside before we dive in to our key six verses that we're going to focus on. Over the years, certainly my journey with the Proclamation Trust over the years, I've learned that it's not just a few purple passages in the Old Testament that point to the Lord Jesus Christ, because the Lord Jesus Christ is everywhere within the Old Testament, and we delight, uh, delight in that. But nevertheless, at the same time, we do need to recognize that there are some texts that are more equal than others. So rather than it being a barren plain with a few mountain peaks where there's the, the Lord Jesus is discovered, that it's actually a plateau where there are many, many sightings of our Lord Jesus Christ. But even so, on this plateau, there are still significant mountain peaks which take us very, very clearly to the Lord Jesus. And Psalm 110 is indeed one of those. So having cleared the ground, let's now come to our second key heading as we focus on three verses, Jesus our guarantor. Chapter 7, verses 20 to 22. What does it say? Well, there is a contrast here in verses 20 and 21, and the word oath comes on three occasions. In verse 20, we're introduced to the Old Testament Levitical priests, and they became priests without an oath. And then in verse 21, there is someone, this one was made a priest with an oath. And where do we learn this? We learn it in Psalm 110 and verse 4. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. Now, it begs a number of questions. What's the difference between the law and an oath? Surely both proceed from the mouth of God. They are both words of God. Clearly, they are both very, very significant and important. But in what way might this teaching about laws and oaths relating to Old Testament Levitical priests and from Psalm 110 have any relevance to my life today? Well, let's poke around a little bit further. An oath is a formal verification of something, uh, for example, in the uh, court of law. But notice here in Psalm 110, verse 4, but this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. The oath is made by the Father to the Son. And if you want just a, a little bit of further background, you might just want to jot down Matthew chapter 22 and verse 43, where the Lord Jesus uh, also quotes from this psalm and says, how is it then that David in the Spirit calls him Lord? In the Spirit. So Psalm 110 is not just God's word to us, but it is the Father's oath to the Son witnessed by the Spirit. It is profoundly Trinitarian. It is something that is contained within the Godhead. The Father, an oath to the Son, witnessed by the Spirit. So what? Well, we've looked at verse 20 and 21, and the so what can be found in verse 
22. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. Now, in this translation, uh, there's a word missing, uh, a Greek word untranslated in ESV and NIV. Perhaps the best translation would be something like this. Accordingly, this makes Jesus the guarantor of a so much more superior covenant. Certainly in chapter 1, verse 4, this construction is a, a so much superior. Or uh, in chapter 12, verse 1, it's so great a cloud of witnesses. It, it's the idea that this is a so much better covenant. So how has the oath has, ha, uh, had this effect? What's so great about it? Well, what's so great about the oath is that it cannot be touched or affected by us and what we do or what we don't do. See, God's word comes to our sinful hearts and we break God's word. God's oath stays within the Trinity. It is a commitment between Father and Son which is never going to be broken, which is completely inviolable. Viable. The Father is never going to break the oath. From time to time, our grandchildren stay. When they've gone, and after I've picked myself up, uh, after collapsing in a heap, the toys are cleared away, everything's sorted out, I collapse on a chair, and then I look at our windows, and I can see fingerprints all over the windows at a very low level. They've been there. Our dirty fingerprints never touch the oath. Our sin and anger and frustration perhaps with a church member, perhaps within the family. Those fingerprints never touch the oath. Our pride, our superiority, our laziness, our lack of vision, whatever the besetting sins that we're struggling with, those fingerprints have nothing to do and bear no relation to what happens between the oath, between the Father and the Son. Therefore, the result is that Jesus is providing us with a secure, guaranteed covenant relationship that will never, ever be affected by our performance or lack of performance. Just imagine, it's a silly illustration, I know, but uh, think of a guarantee for a a washing machine, or a, I know guarantees, warranties, they're slightly different, but let's imagine you've got a, a, a washing machine, but no guarantees, no warranty with it. And so it, uh, it runs, but then it breaks down. And so, well, there's, uh, the washing can't be done. So uh, soon you're running out of socks, you're running out of shirts, and you're trying to get it fixed. It's going to be inordinately expensive. And, uh, and anyway, they can't come. And so just the washing never gets done, never gets done. And eventually you have run out of shirts. You have run out of socks. But compare the situation where the washing machine does have a guarantee, a warranty. And just for sake of argument, something does go wrong. But immediately somebody is there according to the guarantee, the warranty. It's already been paid for and everything is fixed. There wasn't even a blip. The shirts are still clean. The socks are cleaned every single day. You have a fully functioning washing machine every single day. What a contrast. And what Jesus is guaranteeing is that that covenant between father and son, based on the oath, is fully functioning to cleanse sins every single hour, every single day. It doesn't matter about our performance, what we've done, what we've not done. Jesus guarantees 
that there is that forgiveness available every single day. You see, the focus here is always on Jesus and what he delivers. The focus is not on our performance. Yesterday afternoon, after I'd finished uh, in uh, the study, I just spent a bit of time weeding in the garden, the vegetable patch. And I found that I was weeding, getting rid of bindweed, the same bindweed that I'd got rid of back in March, but it's back. And so it is with our sin, isn't it? Constantly judging our relationship with God on the basis of our last sermon or on the basis of what we've done in the last week. Constantly determining things on the basis of our performance. But here we are reminded that Jesus is the guarantor of this better covenant that is never, ever going to be broken. It is always fully functioning to deliver cleansing and refreshment. But let's move on to our third and final heading. Jesus, our intercessor, verses 23 to 25. And again, what does it say? And there's a contrast again, verse 23, the Old Testament, verse 24, the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 23, there are many Old Testament priests due to death. We've been celebrating our Queen's Platinum Jubilee. And the contrast between all those prime ministers who have served under her, 14 of them, I think, to date, uh, as against her one reign. But of course, even she eventually will die. But the contrast is with the Lord Jesus, verse 24, who holds his office permanently since he continues forever. And where do we learn this? In Psalm 110 and verse 4, you are a priest forever. And so Psalm 110, verse 4, carries the doctrinal weight of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's nothing else in this passage that is giving proofs of resurrection or anything like that, but it's there in Psalm 110, verse 4, that guarantees deep in the Old Testament the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, that gives him an indestructible life, according to chapter 7 and verse 16. Well, again, we ask, what is the result? What's the so what? Well, it's given to us by the author in verse 25. Consequently, he's able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. He always lives as priest. Have you wondered, what is the Lord Jesus Christ doing now? Perhaps you could think of a a friend or a spouse or a child and, and ask that question. I wonder what they're doing now. Perhaps if it's a a teenage son or daughter, perhaps you don't want to think about those sorts of things. But what are they doing right now? And what is the Lord Jesus Christ doing right now? Well, we know the answer to that from the book of Hebrews. We know that he's uh, he's finished his work. He sat down, not doing anything, job done. Well, of course, that is very true, and that is a very strong theme within the book of Hebrews, but that relates to his once and for all sacrifice that will never be completed, that has been finished, and he has sat down. But there is this other strand which highlights exactly what he's doing, which is here in verse 25. And what is he doing? He is making intercession for those who draw near to God through him. He is applying the fruit of his sacrificial work. May I just read from the book of Exodus, chapter 28, verse 9, about the ministry of the high priest. You shall take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel, Six of their names on one stone and the names of the remaining six on the other stone in order of their birth. As a jeweler, 
engrave signets, so shall you engrave the two stones with the names of the sons of Israel. You shall enclose them in settings of gold filigree, and you shall set the two stones on the shoulder pieces of the ephod as stones of remembrance for the sons of Israel. And Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord on his two shoulders for remembrance." The names of God's people on the shoulders of the high priest, bringing them to remembrance before the Father. They've all had their sins paid for, Father. They're all forgiven. They're all your children. As we recognize our failures our very name written, as it were, on the shoulders of our Lord Jesus Christ, this very minute being presented to the Father, Jesus interceding for his people. We have some wonderful complementary truths today. This morning, we were wonderfully led through Deuteronomy 32. And that uh, clarion call that echoes through the Scriptures, how important it is, remember the rock. But the complementary truth here, the Lord Jesus remembers you. He remembers your name. Even at this very moment, he is taking your name before the Father. This one, your child, paid for, purchased, redeemed, reconciled, adopted. This one, reconciled. This one, adopted. All special, treasured in the Father's eyes. And therefore, yes, he lives as priest forever, in order to make intercession, and as a result of that, he is able to save to the uttermost. It's a glorious translation, isn't it? It's a sense of the, 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 the quantity of time he is always able to save, but also quality he is able to save completely, absolutely, in any situation. There's something comprehensive about the word, the word to assure us that when we are utterly cast down, that when we are utterly in despair in our sin and failure, he is able to save to the uttermost. The book by Dane Ortland, Gentle and Lowly, which I'm sure that many of you will be familiar with, it came at just the right time at the start of that lockdown period. I'm sure that I quoted it so many times at a certain point that the church where I serve, that the folk probably played a version of bingo. And as soon as I uh, mentioned Dane Ortland and Gentle and Lowly, there were sort of knowing looks around and, uh, and a tick. But what a profound chapter about this neglected doctrine of the intercession of our Lord Jesus Christ for us. Justification, he writes, is tied to what Christ did in the past. Intercession is what he's doing in the present. Think of it this way. Christ's heart is a steady reality flowing through time. It isn't as if his heart throbbed for his people when he was on earth, but it's dissipated now that he's in heaven. It's not that his heart was flowing in a burst of mercy that took him all the way to the cross, but has now cooled down, settling back once more into kindly indifference. His heart is as drawn to his people now as it ever was. And the present manifestation of his heart for his people is his constant interceding on their behalf. Or again, it does, intercession applies what the atonement accomplished. Christ's present in heavenly intercession on our behalf is a reflection of the fullness and victory and completeness of his earthly work, not a reflection of anything lacking in his earthly work. The atonement accomplished our salvation. Intercession is the moment-by-moment -moment application of that atoning work. 
In the past, Jesus did what he now talks about. In the present, Jesus talks about what he then did. The intercession of Christ is his heart connecting our heart to the Father's heart. And finally, from Dane Ortland, our sinning goes to the uttermost, but his saving goes to the uttermost. And his saving always outpaces and overwhelms our sinning because he always lives to intercede for us. Perhaps some here this afternoon have known utter despair, utter darkness. He has saved to the uttermost. But perhaps there's some here who are currently unbeknown to others, in utter despair, utter darkness. And this is a reminder that our Lord Jesus is our intercessor who saves to the uttermost. The focus here is on the Lord Jesus and his ongoing work and ministry as high priest, When we are out of energy, when we are out of order in our lives, Psalm 110 verse 4 proclaims that Jesus, our high priest, lives and he lovingly bears up your name, treasuring your name and presenting it to the Father. And on the basis of what Father has promised the Son, that better covenant, the results are guaranteed that you are fully accepted. You could not be any more fully accepted through what the Lord Jesus Christ has done and is praying for you now. As we finish, it's interesting that in chapter 6, verse 1, the author encourages his hearers to leave behind the elementary teachings of Christ. But notice he is not asking them to leave that elementary doctrine of Christ for anything else, for other doctrines. He's asking them to leave the elementary doctrines of Christ for a fuller, richer experience of knowing and treasuring the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what is it that we need as we gather? What is it that we need amidst our sluggishness and all our struggles and our drifting and our sinfulness? No, not new techniques, not even new resources, not new initiatives, though all of those may have their place. But we need that new appreciation and vision of our Lord Jesus Christ in all his richness. And so perhaps these are two aspects of Christ we've not looked at perhaps for some time. He's our guarantor. He's signed off on it. And there's nothing you can do about it. He's done it. He guarantees his covenant will always apply to you. And he is always interceding, taking your very name to the Father. This one belongs to you. We love them, don't we? Says Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Let us, amidst everything that we're doing, consider this Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.